What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 316. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources and joining me on the line, just like every single week. Are, are you in Denver? Yeah. Okay. From Denver, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how goes, <laughs> sir? It, it, it goes well. Uh, I, I know you're going to head home at some point, right? Back to uh, sunny California for the holiday. Is that correct? It is. It is. I, I'm here in Denver along with uh, my in-laws uh, for the next 12 days. Uh, but then I uh, am heading home back to California for a week. Ah, the 12 days of Christmas. Sounds fun. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I assume it's it's dumping snow there in the Mile High City. You know, it actually snowed a lot more last week. There's still snow on the ground, but this, there's not a ton of snow this week. This is the only time I'm like mildly jealous uh, of snow because normally I'm over snow. I hate it. Get it away from me. I can't drive in it. It's awful. But man, when it's Christmas and you got the tree and the, the holidays are going on, you know, it's not too bad to have a little yeah, snow. Yeah, but when you're under snow, that's the real problem. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, Limited Resources is brought to you each and every week by ChannelFireball.com. Uh, lots of things to do at Channel Fireball. Uh, if you need to get you know, spend some of that holiday money that you may have gotten or, or something along those lines. You can uh, find everything you may want magic related at Channel Fireball, including sealed product. You can find uh, singles, you know, fill out that that deck of yours, whatever it is that you happen to be working on. You can find apparel. You can get limited resources T-shirts there. We've got all the sizes that we offer in stock over there right now at Channel Fireball. And uh, of course, got a little downtime maybe for the holidays. Hey, take in a, a, a draft video or, you know, maybe read an article. It's all free. All the content from some of the best players in the world at ChannelFireball.com. And if you're planning on going to GP Oakland, which is coming up a little sooner than you might think, it's just uh, in that first week of January, the second week of January, uh, you're going to want to go to GPOakland.com to get pre-registered and to find out any of the exciting announcements and information uh, that you might want to know about that, including you know artists that are going to be there, that kind of stuff. It's all on GP Oakland. Um, the show, of course, is also brought to you by you, the listener. And the way that that works is through a site called Patreon. And uh, it's really straightforward. You go there, patreon.com slash limited resources, and you can sign up. And basically, the way it works is whenever a show comes out, it charges you. You choose how much you would like to give per show, whatever the show is worth to you. If you feel like you've won some booster packs or, you know, gotten some extra enjoyment out of it, you can uh, sign up for any amount and, it, and it'll do that. You can quit any time. There's no commitments or anything like that. And, uh, and for signing up, you get a thank you card. Uh, a bunch of those are going out in the mail uh, this week. I've been working on those um, quite a bit and, uh, and, uh, and another batch to go out uh, next week as well. And uh, you also get some cool perks and bonuses. Um, a few things that you get out of it. One, you get entered into giveaways. And I've got, I think, our last Delver playmat. I'm going to double check. I either have uh, one or two left. I'm going to I'm gonna look. But I know Where's I have at least stores, one. You can just flip one over, use the other side. <laughs> just cut it in half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we've got our winner for that. Our winner uh, is Belle Rios. So thank you so much for your support, Belle. That was... Uh, very kind of you. And Bell, Bell's from München, which is in Germany. And uh, I like that place. So thank you, Bell, And congratulations. I'll be shipping out your Delver playmat probably after the holidays here as uh, the it's kind of a mess anyway, and you probably wouldn't get it that quickly. <clears throat> so I'm just going to wait till the post office calms down a little, and then I will be sending out your playmat. Um, also, if you're a patron, you get to uh, put questions in for the Patreon question of the week. Now, the Patreon question of the week comes from our friend Mike Scott. And Mike wants to know, would you ever draft a mono color deck? Now, he does, you know, make sure that we're, we know what he's asking about, you know, maybe not like some of the more complex sets, you know, thinking of like Cons of Tarkir, something like that, where, you know, drafting a mono color deck just really isn't feasible. But, you know, in, in some of the more straightforward two color sets, would you ever draft a mono color deck? And, you know, I'm kind of adding on to the question here as well. Is, is it good? Is that a goal? Is that something that you're interested in, uh, you know, when you sit down to draft? So in general, the reason – well, there's a couple reasons you don't see monocolor decks all that frequently, even in just like a normal two-color format. The first is that it's hard to get that many playables. It's hard to get 23 red playables. So you're just going to often end up playing other colors just out of necessity. The The second is what's your incentive? The incentive of playing a monocolor deck at the base level is that your mana is better. You, you can never draw – you know, four mountains and no islands and draw blue cards. In a monocolor deck, you draw four mountains, you can cast all your spells pretty much. Mm -hmm. But the mana, when you have like, you know, a 10-7 or 11-6 deck, your mana is going to be pretty good. Even 9-8, your mana is going to be fine. So that's not a huge issue either. 
Where monocolor decks come up is when you have a, a specific card that is paying you to do that. Like a good example is corrupt. You know, five and a black, deal one for each swamp you control and gain that much life. So when corrupt is legal, and you know, it's been printed in a couple core sets, it's got it got printed in like what is it, uh Shadow Moor and obviously in Urza Saga initially. They're Drafting monocolor or near monocolor was an actual thing. If you got like two or three corrupts, all of a sudden the, the payoff for having 17 swamps in your deck just went through the roof. Mm -hmm. And when a card like that is in the format, it gets a lot more enticing to draft a monocolor deck. That's just not often – there aren't often that many incentives. And if there aren't incentives, then you really shouldn't be doing it because it, you need two things to come together. One is that you need a reason to draft monocolor. The second is that you actually need to get enough cards. And so even – even when you had double corrupt, sometimes you had to play four mountains or five mountains in your deck because you needed to splash four red cards. Otherwise, you just would you, you can't play a twenty-two land deck. So, in general, no, you're not going to draft a monocolor deck all that often. Sometimes it becomes right to do so, but even if it's like completely open, often like for example, let's say white was completely open in BFC, you're the only person playing white at the table. You got a ton of white cards. Still, probably worth splashing two clutch of currents in a royal yeah, spot or, totally. or whatever. Whatever it always your best ends up two. being like that too. Yeah. Basically, if you have two to three off-color cards that are amazing, it's worth playing five lands because you don't really get a benefit by drawing six planes and zero islands. You know, like playing a monocolor uh, deck where all you have is planes in your deck, the fourth and fifth planes don't really do that much for you. So, whereas if, you're, if you have a deck with a bunch of corrupts, then yes, fifth and sixth swamp is great. But in general, no, you're not really going to end up monocolor unless there's specific reasons in the set to draft monocolor. Yeah. The, the other thing to keep in mind, I think with monocolor is that it does come with serious deficiencies, right? Like there are, if you draft monocolor, depending on the color, there's going to be permanent types or sizes of creatures that you just can't deal with. Period. You just, you, since your deck is so narrow and only in the one color, if they cast a big thing, right. And you're mono green, well, you're kind of out of luck and that big thing is going to run you over because you don't have any hard removal spells. And, you know, if you're mono black and they cast an enchantment, you're not getting rid of the enchantment, for example. So, you know, there, there, it does introduce some pretty big holes in the strategy and it ends up being that two colors is usually the right balance um, for those things. And like Louis said, the incentives aren't super strong to be mono. It is kind of fun. I, I do enjoy it. Um but yeah, overall, it's it's weird because it seems like it would be really good and it ends up being not not quite as good. Um, all right. So we're going to do a crack a pack. Uh, so we actually got a lot of stuff lined up for this for this week. We're going to have some fun. Uh, Luis and I have been doing a bunch of, uh, you know, level up episodes and such. And so we thought, well, we'll kick back a little bit here. We're going to, you know, kind of do some this week in drafting. We're going to look back at some of the decks that we've been drafting. Uh, one of the feedback pieces that we got, um, you know, after we did the last show was, you know, people like to hear about the decks that we were playing. That was something that Brian and I did a little more often, not structured, but like it just came up more. And so we're going to go back to that and, and let you guys know what we've been drafting and what's been working and what hasn't. Um, and then for the second part, we're, we're going to do a crack a draft because again, feedback that we got from you, the listener are that you like those. Um, and those are of course are the ones where we don't just do pack one, pick one. We go down to like pack one, pick four, right? Where we, we really kind of get the ball rolling on a draft and get an idea for, for what's going on with that. So we're going to do that after. Um, but for the crack a pack this week, since we're going to do the big crack a draft thing later, I figured we would do kind of a fun one. We do one from the holiday cube. And uh, this is what's out right now, and and we're going to be talking about it for the you know this week in drafting what we've been looking at. And uh, so I've got one pack that I had opened earlier um, in the week in Holiday Cube, and uh, let's get right into it. Now this one's going to be a little slow going because I'm going to read all the cards, um, but here it is. Uh, Flicker Wisp is our first card, which is one white white one white white for a three one flying elemental. And when, in, when it enters the battlefield, you exile another target permanent and then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. Um, very cool card. Uh, <laughs> not at all what I want to do in a holiday cube, though. Um, I'm assuming you agree with that, Luis? Yeah, I I think the Flicker Wisp is a fine card. It's a you know three power flying for three mana and has a, a good come into play ability. It actually does something relevant, but... Three power for a three for a three or uh, three mana for a three power flying is really not what I'm trying to do in the in the cube. Yeah, it's just not, and and not in this cube specifically. Uh, that said, Flicker Wisp is really cool. If you bounce a token, it never comes back. You can bounce a blocker to get in for a bunch of attacks. You can bounce something that they stole. You comes back on your side. There's a lot of really neat uses that you can use 
Flicker Wisp 4, but yeah, not what I want to do. Uh, next is Wrath of God. That's, you know, of course, two white, white, destroy all creatures. They can't be regenerated. Um, frankly, also not really what I want to do in the cube. Um, in the Legacy cube, I actually like a Wrath pretty decently. But in the uh, Holiday cube, I, I tend to uh, value these a lot lower. Yeah, the problem with Wrath in the Holiday Cube is that people are doing some pretty broken nonsense things, and Wrath doesn't really interact with those all that much. So I, I would generally pass on Wrath. I like cards like Swords to Pleasures a lot more. And it, it's funny um, because, you know, you said people are doing broken nonsense things. I want to be that person, <laughs> right? Like my goal when I sit down and open up that first pack of the Holiday Cube is to put myself in that camp and kind of ignore the not broken, you know, stuff uh, for the most part. Well, yeah, it's... It's not only that you want to be the one doing the broken things, even if you aren't the one doing the broken things, which is fine too. Drafting a control deck is plausible. Wrath's not even good against the great decks. No. So you, you want cards in your deck that are good against good decks, even if you're, you're you're not drafting a deck that's trying to go off. Yeah, you know what? And we'll talk about that when we get to this week in drafting too. We'll go a little deeper. I'm going to I'm gonna pick your brain about that. Uh, next is Sower of Temptation. That's uh, two blue blue for a two two flying fairy. You get control of target creature. When it enters the battlefield and if you don't control – when it dies or when you don't control it anymore, you have to give the creature back. Um, I'm actually a fan in, of – Insurance plan against uh, – Well, <laughs> yeah, the, the, re the reason I like Sower over Wrath is that mm -hmm. Sower, Sower gives you a sizable advantage when it works. Wrath is kind of you know closer to parity since a lot of the time you're going to have to – Wrath one creature, maybe two creatures away, but sowering a good threat all of a sudden puts your opponent on a really fast clock. And people don't have that much removal because so so few creatures are running around mm -hmm. that I've really just had my sower live almost every single time. So oh, that's I've, interesting. So far, I like sower. We're only you know we're only three cards into the pack, but sower temptation is quite good. Uh, next is Gideon Jura, uh, great planeswalker, three white white for a planeswalker, and uh, this is this is a kind of card that can really. Uh, you know, kind of stabilize a board, right? Um, he comes in at six loyalty and you can plus two him to make basically all your, all your opponent's creatures attack him next turn. Uh, you can minus two him, still leaving him at four loyalty to destroy target tapped creature. And then if you need to just finish the game off, you can pay zero loyalty to make him into a six, six guy. That's, you know, whatever he, he prevent all damage that would be dealt to him, et cetera. And he, and he beats down and, uh, smashes people. He's not indestructible though, right? Uh, he is, he is, he is indestructible. When oh, he start. is. Yeah. I believe so. Let me no, I think he's not. I think only the new one is. Let me, I'm going to double check. Uh, six is, that's still a planeswalker prevent all damage. It's just prevent all damage. You can okay. still doom blade him or whatever. Yeah, you but, can doom blade it, but it can't die yeah. in combat. Exactly. It so, doesn't die in combat. So I was closer to right than you. <laughs> that is definitely as, not the case. As long as we're clear about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think about Gideon? I, I actually, uh, don't think he's terrible. Um, this, he does fall more in the fair side of things for me than not. So I, I don't think I'd be looking to first pick him, but I have ran him. I think maybe he's even in one of the decks we're going to talk about today. Well, uh, no, he's I, not. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking for more spots to disagree with you. So I'll go ahead and say that uh, I, I don't really want Gideon in my deck. Okay. <laughs> you <laughs> uh, found one. I'm taking Sword of Temptation here. Um, a Fiamancer is next, a card I've really been impressed by specifically in the other cube. I, I haven't really figured it out for this one yet, but, um, you know, it's a 2-2 two, two for 3 mana, but at the beginning of each upkeep, you get a 1-1 one, one Death Touch Snake token, which is like, this card seems so underwhelming when I first saw it, and it's overperformed for me every time I've played it. It's just really annoying if, if people are trying to attack you on the ground. Truth of the matter, though, is that in this cube, that isn't really the name of the game, and so a few answer drops off quite a bit, and, and not really what I'm looking for either. Yeah, this is a very cool card, which is what I say every time I see it, and then I never take it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's sad, right? I, yeah, it's better than it looks. I will say that. Uh, Faithless looting card, I basically never take. It's you know, red sorcery, draw two, discard two, and you can flash it back for what is it like two and a red? Uh, yeah, I I love faithless looting. I think the card's great. I I don't want to first pick it, but when I'm in a deck with like goblin welder or draw sevens or all, other sorts of nonsense, then faithless looting becomes a lot better. Yeah, I mean, the truth of it is it's not a bad card. I just hate it. I don't know. I never play it. Um, all right, so this is – we've reached one of the sort of cruxes, right, of of uh, how, how do you approach cube of fate, of fate, if you will. <laughs> this is Sulfuric Vortex. So this uh, is a one red red enchantment. Yeah. Players can't gain life. At the start of each player's upkeep, they take two damage. So 
for those of you who haven't played uh, against or with this card, it ends the game really quickly. With the fact that you're, first of all, you're losing two life a turn, which is a big deal. Second of all, decks that play this just try to hit you for a lot more than two a turn. It's just great in mono red. And it stops you from getting life, so it stops you from doing the thing that would be the most likely way of getting out of this. So, it's I think a, so I, It's the scariest card in the cube. Yeah, I think so. Fear Vortex is one of fear. the best first picks in Legacy Cube, which is Cube Without Power. I don't think it's one of the best first picks in Vintage Cube, but I do think it's quite plausible. If you if you take Sulfuric Vortex first, like, for example, if this is a Cube Pro Tour, there's a chance I would take it first out of this pack. Because I actually have found that the, the red deck, as long as you prioritize artifact removal, the, the mono red deck is surprisingly good. Mm. Cards, cards like Ancient Grudge and Smash to Smithereens can just let you stop the broken decks from going off because they are a little fragile. And you're going to play cards like Sulfuric Vortex and one mana two ones or one mana two twos and just kill your opponent. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in, for my money mm-hmm. of the mono red decks that yet that see play in cube, I think Sulfuric Vortex is the best card in the whole deck. Like I, in my mind, Sulfuric Vortex is the card to have. Like it's the, it's the red flag that goes by, right? If you see that card wheel, you know, nobody is in red. Cause to me, that's just the best possible card. It's so difficult to beat. Yeah. It's a two, unblockable 2-2 two, two haste that also stops life gain, which is what you care about the most. Yeah, like because you, you, oftentimes your opponent's sitting there staring at a Thrag Tusk or whatever, and you're just like, yeah, sorry, man, you're just dead. Um, next is Magus of the Moon. What does that guy do? It's a Blood Moon on Wheels. It's Tuna yeah. Red for a 2-2 two, two that makes all non-basic lands into mountains. This is a fine card, too. I think it is kind of counterfeited by Sulfuric Vortex just because... If you have uh, the option of taking one of these two red cards first, you should just take the Vortex. Like I, I, I like Magus. I think it's a it's a fine card, but Silver Vortex is better for the decks that would want either. Yeah, you know, I've been on kind of a kick, a kind of a land destruction slash disruption kick lately, but Magus of the Moon hasn't made the cut for me. Um, I, I don't know. I just always feel like I'm pretty bummed out of my opponents not playing that many base, non-basics, and like I... Probably just started in the sideboard, and, and in that case, I'm not first picking it anyway. Uh, Birds of Paradise is next. Yeah, you can't really go too wrong with birds. The, no. the mono green ramp deck is a little worse than it, it would be if you know moxes weren't around, but mm. it's still good. I still think you can end up with a good a good ramp deck. So one of the things I, I, I love about Cube, and I think that's one of the reasons that so many people love Cube, is that there's a lot of different things you can do, and it feels like in your, when you open your first pack, you have all these different possibilities. Birds is definitely one of those possibilities. Taking so so far, the cards I would be I would be I think are acceptable to first pick are Birds of Paradise, Sulfuric Vortex, and Sower of Temptation. I, mm-hmm. I would be fine first picking any of those cards here. Yeah, I agree. Uh, by the way, I refuse to read what Birds of Paradise does based on principle. Um, Thrag Tusk is next. I just mentioned the Thrag Dad, um, and uh, you know he's so he's five mana for a five three. When he enters a battlefield, you gain fine life. And when uh, he I'm leaves, gonna say, I'm gonna say it's actually the Thrag Mother. Someone pointed out that you, you can't just append <laughs> father to everything, and Thrag Tusk does literally make a three three. So we're gonna go with the Thrag Mother. And she I like is a, Thrag Mother. She's four and a green for a five three. <laughs> uh, when she enters a battlefield, you gain five life. And when she leaves a battlefield, not when she dies, when she leaves the battlefield, uh, you get a three three beast token. So that that means exile and bounce also triggers uh, the the beast coming into play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the best mid-range green cards ever, uh, and certainly it holds its own in in Legacy Cube. But again, I, I just see these type of cards as like, yeah, I respect it. It's a good card, but it's just so not what I want to be, do, be doing in this type of cube. I mean, I view it as almost like an insurance policy against the creature decks because it's very, very good against those type of decks. But those aren't the good decks, right? Those aren't the decks I'm aiming for when I draft. Those aren't the decks I'm worried about, right? A, a deck that is going to play like a two drop and a three drop creature or whatever. So for me, Thrag Tusk just goes a lot goes down in value accordingly. Agreed. It's the kind of card you would want post board, but it and it's a okay to main deck. It's just medium in in all, in all regards. I, Again, we're talking about how, you know, I said Vortex makes me not want to take Magic the Moon. Birds of Paradise makes me not want to take the right test. If I'm starting with yeah. the green card here, it's going to be birds. Right, exactly. Uh, Tundra is next. Of course, the old school dual land types for white or blue. The dual lands and shock lands are very important because they can get fetched by all the fetched lands. So, you know, Scalding Tarn now, if you have a Tundra, Scalding Tarn gets you blue, white, or red, which means your mana is going to be great. And like we kind of went over in the cube episode, having... 
substantially better mana than you would in a normal limited environment is key because your opponents are going to have great mana if, if they're drafting cube correctly. And Tundra is certainly part of that. I I would not blame anyone from taking any blue dual land first pick. I I think that that ends up being played a lot so often and helping your mana so often that it's very reasonable to take Tundra here. It's kind of funny that you would not really consider Tundra versus Sower of Temptation in any sort of normal limited, you know, yeah. format. Because Sower is like one of the best cards and Tundra is just fine. But mana fixing is really, really important because everyone's got a deck full of good cards. You just want to make sure you can cast all of them. Yeah, I, I, I tend to scan the packs for this thing and, and kind of break it down to like, is there something broken here? Yes, no. If not, then... What does the mana look like? And it can be a, a land like Tundra or it can be some type of mana ramp card like a, an elf or a, a, um, like a Birds of Paradise. But more importantly, I'm looking for mana artifacts, right? Like colorless ways to make my mana go. So uh, Tundra is on that list. You know, it is. Um, Temple of Mystery is next. That's the blue-green scry land. Um, I mean, I would just rather have a Tundra. Like th- these cubes are pretty fast and being able to fetch these things up and stuff really does end up mattering. So even though scrying is very powerful, it doesn't trump, uh, you know, an original dual land for me in this cube. Agreed. Hey, I, I like dual lands, but the ones that can't be fetched with uh, the fetch lands are so much less of a priority. If Temple of Mystery counted as a forest and an island, I could see an argument for it over Tundra, but I can't see mm-hmm. an argument uh, the way things stand. Yeah. Ooh, here's one. Orzov Signet. Ooh, a signet. <laughs> I think it's uh, pronounced signe, but that, that is actually what you should be saying because signets know. are criminally underappreciated. You know, <laughs> this, this happens every cube, by the way. The first week or so of cube, you'll see signets ten, like tenth pick, and then it, people just stop doing that. So I, I would expect signets to get picked higher and higher as we uh, continue through the cube here. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Orzov signets a. Uh, a uh, great card. It's a black white signet, which is not really what you want. So for I guess we didn't really exactly cover what signet is. It's two mana for an artifact. Oh, yeah. You pay one and tap it, and add, it adds two colored mana of whatever its guild is. In the case of Orzov, that's black white. So yeah. it's a two mana artifact that ramps you directly to four if you play it on turn two. It only costs you one mana the turn you play it if you can use it right away, and it fixes your mana. It double fixes. So. Whereas I think is it signet is one of the better first picks in the cube, just because red and blue are so complementary, and it's in a, a color that doesn't have uh, acceleration. Or is I'm saying that's a little lower on my hierarchy. So I would lump this in the category of cards you could first pick. Though honestly, you know, it, it, if we were going to do a bunch more cube cracker packs, we'd end up with the same the same thing I think was going to happen in this pack, which is most cube packs don't have a clear pick. They just have what are the different good directions you want to go and you just kind of have to choose among them. Yeah. Sure, sometimes you open an Ancestral Recall or a Soul Ring because this is a power cube, you can do that. But in a pack... That has, you know, as we've seen so far in this pack, we don't have don't have a piece of power in a pack like this. Then it's it's not like, wow, you're crazy if you don't take sower, or you're crazy if you don't take birds. It's just which like, direction you want to go. What do you, do you like to do? Yeah, just pick the deck you like to draft and draft it. That's why cube is so great. Yeah, totally. And I'll tell you what, at this point, the signet is is definitely my my pick. Um, two more cards to go. Nickel Bolas Planeswalker for our. <laughs> For our listeners who haven't seen this guy before, <laughs> this is a pretty absurd planeswalker. Um, it costs eight mana, four black, black, blue, red, and he comes down at five loyalty. And uh, you can plus three to destroy a non-creature permanent, anything. Non-creature, as long as it's not a creature, you can blow it up and he's at eight loyalty. You can minus two to just straight up gain control of a creature. That doesn't have any clauses on it, by the way. It's just mine. And uh, his ultimate is minus nine, and uh, that's he does seven damage to target player. That player discards seven cards and then sacrifices seven permanent. So it's a pretty close to game winner uh, if you can get that going as well. Um, you know, it's weird. I, I mentioned uh, that I like to look for broken things to do, um, but strangely, Nickel Bull's Planeswalker is not one of them, uh, even though this card is obviously rawly powerful and, and really, really cool, too. Um, it's just not the type of effect that I'm looking for um, in this cube as being kind of this big, expensive, clunky finisher. Nicole Bolts is fine. He's not, you know, he's not head and shoulders above or wings and shoulders above uh, a lot of the other finishers. He's just another good one. So I, I don't really prioritize taking these these giant finishers all that all, all that much just because you just end up with one or two and you really only need one or two. Yeah, I mean... Sundown Titan is a great card. Nicole Bolas is, is a pretty strong card. I'm still not taking those over like a Signet or a Tundra very often. Yeah. And 
we'll talk about it in a minute, but the casting cost thing is a huge deal too in this cube. Um, Abrupt Decay is our last card, you yeah. know, black, green, destroy target. Uh, Non-land permanent with converted mana costs three or less, and it's an instant. And it's uncountable. Can't be countered, yeah. So um, if you sure. if you want to draft a normal, you know, black, green, uh, mid-range deck that everyone loves drafting in cube, go ahead, take Abrupt Decay. I don't believe that is the best move to do. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I, I said there's no clear picks he, or first pick here, but Abrupt Decay is clearly not a first pick. So th- there are some cards that you can rule out. And I, I, I think taking Abrupt Decay here it would be uh, not a good idea. So I like the list that you came up with. For me, it is it, it would be between Tundra and Orzov Signet in this pack. Like if I open this today and I would take the Signet. I would actually also take Orzov Signet, pick one, just because Signets are very, very important to the artifact-based deck that I, I taught Marshall how to draft. I thought but, you were trying to disagree with me more. Uh, ooh, well, <laughs> I, I guess I, I guess I'll have to pick my spots. But take the Tundra. <laughs> if you were looking to take Sword of Temptation, Sulfuric Vortex, Tundra, or Orzov Signet, or Birds of Paradise, those are all those are all I think very reasonable picks. I, I would not fault anyone for taking those cards. I, I would at, right now take Orzov Signet, but any of those picks seem reasonable and they all kind of go in different directions. Tundra and Orzob Signet are two safest. Yeah. They don't really commit you to almost anything. Whereas Birds, Sulfuric Vortex, and Sower all commit you to a different thing. Sower to being like a blue control deck. Birds to being a green ramp deck. And then uh, Sulfuric Vortex, of course, to being blue ramp control. But... All right. Well, um, when it comes to... Vortex was for Mono Red Burn, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was giving you an out to disagree with me, but... I, I didn't want to. I, <laughs> I'm just going to let you hang. Um, so this week in drafting, what have we been drafting? Um, I've been drafting the cube. Um, I think I did either one or zero Battle for Zendikar drafts uh, while the cube was up, um, or since the cube's been up. And uh, I don't know. It was just a nice break. I, I think I was ready for to draft a little cube. And I've been really enjoying drafting it. And uh, I mean, you kind of said it, but the the Signet deck is really what I've been doing. Um, You know, I find the same thing that you do, that these are generally underrated relative to their power level. Uh, They're also colorless. So it means that you can play them in, in multiple decks. The particular colors that they produce isn't that important to me. Like, yeah, there's preferable signets to other signets but it's just the fact that i can pay something on play something on turn two that opens up four mana and can really get things moving ahead and there are significant rewards for playing a bunch of artifacts in this cube too so um yeah that's kind of been been what i'm doing um when i i I mentioned it before but i want to reiterate when i when i draft a cube my goal it doesn't i don't always hit it but my goal is to do over the top busted stuff right i don't want to bring a deck to the table that is just sort of good, right? Where it's like, oh, well, I can counter your spell and then I can play something that draws me an extra card or whatever. Like I normally really enjoy decks like that, but for for the holiday cube, I just feel like it's like I mean they they took the reins off, right? Like they're letting me run wild, so I might as well do it. And uh so I try to draft crazy stuff. And Luis, I don't know if you have any experience with this type of deck, but what I tried to do in the early part of the week, <laughs> uh to not a lot of success, I will I might add is I kept trying to draft decks that blew up a bunch of lands. Um, and one of the ones I'm looking at here has a decent amount of uh, artifact mana. Uh, it has three signets. It has a mana crypt. That's the zero mana one that adds two to your mana pool, but you flip a coin. And unless you're Luis, uh, you lose three life whenever you lose <laughs> the coin flip. Luis loses almost never. Um, I've also got a mana vault, which is the one that costs a colorless mana and taps for three mana. Um, but it hurts you during your, well, I guess your draw step technically or whatever you can pay for it to untap. And if you don't, you take one damage to turn off it. And then I've also got warm power stone, which is three colorless that taps to add two colorless and it enters the battlefield tapped plus a gilded Lotus, which is five colorless that taps to add three mana of any one color to your mana pool. Now I've got all of those things. So a lot of artifact mana. And then I combine those with Armageddon three and a white destroy all lands Ravages of War, same exact card, just from a different set. Um, An Avalanche Riders, which is like whatever. Um, And then, but importantly here, I have Wildfire, which is four red, red. Each player sacrifices four lands, and then it does four damage to each creature. And then Burning of Jinye, which is basically the same card. It's like worded a little different, but basically it does four to everything, and, and each player loses four lands. And, you know, my thinking on it was like, this could be cool. Like, I'm gonna, 
try to ramp out a bunch of artifact mana and then just blow up all the lands, right? Just be like Armageddon, you know, and then just and then burning like to to or wildfire I should say to to wipe the board of any smaller creatures. And if you're continually blowing up lands, it's really hard for people to get big creatures out. So you know it, the wildfire type cards end up working really well with themselves. Um, have you ever experimented with this type of deck in the cube? I think wildfire itself is almost a deck just because wildfire you think so? is such an impactful card. Okay. Like you're talking about decks with wildfire and avalanche riders and ravages of war and Armageddon, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You can draft a pretty successful man to denial strategy off just wildfire. There's also burning of Zinye or Zinye. I don't actually know how to say that. Um, but the portal three kingdom version of wildfire, the exact same card. Uh, and they both cost, you know, four red, red, they kill every deal four to everything and kill four lands. If you just have both those cards or one of those cards and a bunch of signets, you, you're a pretty good shot of just making it so your opponent can't do anything. Yeah. Like, it was so close, too. I, I had another one, Luis, that was um, – I had Wildfire, Burning, Ravages of War, but no uh, Armageddon. But I did have Balance, and I also had Winter Orb. Yeah. Winter Orb, um, not really a combo with Armageddon, but yes, they both are. They both do the same thing. Yeah, both basically just like a two-mana, you know, Ravages. I'm just trying to, like, keep you off of stuff. And then I had three Signets. I played a Mox Diamond, which is another card I wanted to ask you about on the show because I've received a lot of, um, you know, kind of – uh, conflicting reviews from players who I respect about Mox Diamond. It's never been high on my list. I've never prioritized it, but I played it in this deck and I played it in one other deck and I was actually pretty impressed by it. I was like, you know, this is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, so um, let's, let's do that first. What do you think about Mox Diamond? And by the way, Mox Diamond is zero for an artifact. And uh, if it would enter the battlefield, you di you can discard a land and if you do, then you can tap it to add any color to manage mana pool. If you don't, it, it just sits there as an artifact. So it's basically a mox, but it costs you a land out of your hand to cast it. I'm a big fan of mox diamond. Oh, it's, you are. It's crap in, in fair decks because throwing away a land in order to, for, you know, an acceleration, because you're down mm. a card here. You spent two cards to get this this mox mm -hmm. is not good but when you're doing when your deck's doing busted things mox time is great it's great with cards like wheel of fortune or time twister it's great with cards like tinker it can do stuff with uh you know cards like wildfire or Tolarian academy or metal worker so mm, okay so you do like it i i'd like mox diamond a i i can not i don't necessarily recommend taking it really early because <laughs> uh, again if your deck's not well suited to take care, to, to take advantage of it it's not a very good card do you think you can get it later anyway yeah, I think most of the time you can. I, yeah. I don't know. It's it's tough because how late cards go varies so wildly because in a normal draft format, a card like, say, Touch of the Void, right? You know, mm -hmm. deals three damage for three mana. You don't wheel that card because every single draft that has a, has people who are drafting red who also think Touch of the Void are good. That just That's just how it works. But Mox Diamond... You could easily end up with a draft with no one or no one thinks Mox Diamond is good. In yeah, most cases. like in I most didn't cases, really just think wheel it was it. good. Yeah, huh? That's super interesting. Yeah, um, this one also tried. I guess I guess it's like a type of prison deck or something, um, because I also had um, Wasteland with this deck. Uh, I also had Fast Bond and Gush, but I I got to say Fast Bond didn't like. I wasn't really breaking it. Um, I was just kind of dumping my my uh, lands, but. I also had Moat, which is two white, white creatures without flying can't attack. It's an enchantment. And that's a real pain for a lot of different types of decks. Even some of the broken decks that are just trying to make huge things, they just can't attack you. And then I also tried out, and this is a card I have played a bit in the past, but not a ton, which is The Abyss, which is, by the way, a super weird card. In fact, I'm going to do you know what it does off the top of your head? I know what it does, but the wording's really strange. The Abyss? Yeah, it says at the beginning. It's three in a black. Yeah. Uh, it's an enchant world, which has some rules implications, but <laughs> we'll ignore that for now. Uh, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, they destroy a target non-artifact creature they control. Yes, they get to choose it. <laughs> yes. It's and, it, and it can't be regenerated. <laughs> so it's targeted, but it's also their choice, which means that if you have a card like that can get Shroud or get Hexproof, then, well, I guess Hexproof actually technically wouldn't work because it's your trigger. But it, if you have a card that can become untargetable, you can target it with Abyss and make it untargetable. It's, it, yes. look, it, it, this is one of the most impactful cards in Magic. Uh, you know, I remember once talking about Magic Slang. And, you know, 
The Abyss is actually a very useful concept because what the, the Abyss does at its core is just eat one of their creatures every single turn. Yeah. Because your deck's presumably is built so it doesn't. One thing that happens often is let's say your your opponent's at, at something like 5 life and you have a 5-5 five, five at and you they have to chump block your 5-5 five, five every turn. You're abyssing your opponent. And you, you'll hear people say that because the Abyss yeah. was, was such an impactful card back in, you know, 93, 94, that sort of thing. I guess it was more like 94, 95. But, uh, yeah, it's from Legends. And uh, when you hear abyssing, that's what that means. It's it, it, you, this this giant creature is acting as the abyss. <laughs> I wish I had the other one, which was uh, time walk. I wish I could time walk my opponent, but yes. I didn't have that. But anyway, this deck ended up being really cool. Um, like you said, I did build it to try to work around the the moat and the abyss that you know that really kind of locked down any type of creature combat. So the only creatures I was playing were effectively spells, right? I had acidic slime. I had avalanche riders. Um, I had a Venser shaper savant. Um, I had a man of war cause I don't pass that card very often. And then I also happen to have a palancron because it can get over the moat. Um, but the interesting thing about the deck was that it generally won with planeswalkers. It was effectively a planeswalker control deck because my whole entire goal was to stick a planeswalker and then, play a wildfire and, you know, wipe away the board or stick a planeswalker and have it be slightly ahead of whatever my opponent was doing and then play ravages of war or winter orb or whatever, and just keep them off of whatever they were doing while my planeswalker took over the game. And it was really fun. It's actually a deck that I think probably isn't tier one for the cube, but it does have a lot of cool things going on. And I could definitely see like, I would be like moat abyss. And there was definitely decks that my opponents were just like, well, <laughs> I don't have answers to those and I just can't win now. Right. And the abyss just chews up their entire board and anything that they had left that might, might've killed me, um, you know, was, you know, uh, rendered null by the moat or whatever. And, and that was it. Um, so I've been having a lot of fun. I, you can see, um, or I can see, you know, looking at some of the decks now, I took some screenshots of them that I really did try and, to like we push can go in this ahead direction. Post that with the podcast too. Yeah, yeah. I'll put actually what I'll do is I'll put them in a uh, I'll put them in a blog on LRCast um, because it's easier to put pictures there than with the show because it gets kind of complicated putting them in the show notes. Um, they won't show up on most of the stuff, but anyway, and uh, yeah, and I'll put I'll put them in there and you can get a look at some of the decks that I tried out. Um, I didn't mark how well each of these did, but I will say that most of them did not do very well. Uh, th these were not like decks I think I lost in the first round uh, with two of the ones that we already talked about. And like the one I just mentioned with the Abyss and the Moat, I lost in the second round with that one. So, you know, th these weren't like 3-0 decks or whatever, but they were certain they were certainly cool. And, and, and I was trying out different directions. I've been playing a lot of Winter Orbs and a lot of Signets lately. So I, I've been doing a similar thing. That, but I basically drafted three kinds of decks over the last week with varying levels of success. The first one is <laughs> Esper Prison, which has is, is trying to abuse Smokestack. <laughs> Bra Braids, which is another Smokestack. Basically, all these cards make people sacrifice permanence during their upkeep. And then mm -hmm. Liliana of the Veil. And You're cards a like jerk. Jeez. Yeah, these decks never win, so don't draft them. Okay, uh, so <laughs> it wasn't just me. <laughs> no, it, 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 horrible. The second is something similar to what you are talking about which are like like signet based big mana artifact wildfire type decks these tend to be pretty good it, if you get the cards for these decks they i think they're very good at blue red base and just basically trying to take as many signets in big impactful spells as possible with wildfire as one of the centerpieces or tinker that that sort of thing and the last deck, and you already talked about that a bunch, but the last deck is a Storm, Storm Combo, which I think is the most fun archetype in the cube. And here you're trying to combine cards like, well, if you're lucky, Black Lotus, but also like Dark Ritual or Lion's Eye Diamond or Seething Song, all these fast mana cards. With Tutors, Yawgmoth's Will, which lets you replay all the cards in your graveyard, and then uh, uh, Storm cards like Tendrils of Agony or Brain Freeze or Empty the Warrens. Also mix success on this. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> it's, it's one of the biggest gambles, right? Like when you start off because you have to commit so hard. To well, for, yeah, you have to commit so hard because basically no cards that you want work in other decks and, very, <laughs> and almost very, and very few cards that are good in other decks are good in your deck. All yeah. you want is fast mana storm cards and draw spells. <laughs> and if you do it right, your deck sounds so busted. Like you kill your opponent on turns like, you know, two through four. You ignore basically everything your opponent does. They can rarely interact with you. But if you do it wrong, you just literally can't win. 
Your deck <laughs> misfires. It can't do anything. Yeah. It's ended up more on that side than the other side. I've got to admit I, that won't stop me from drafting storm, but my win percentage has not been good. So if I were to give actionable advice onto what you should be doing in this cube, I do think taking signets and good blue and red cards is, is a pretty good uh, way to go. I've also been more impressed with the mono red deck than I was in previous iterations of the vintage cube. Mm-hmm. I think partially it's because time vault is gone and that, that card is busted. Partially it's just because if you take cards like, again, Ancient Grudge or Smash to Smithereens or Manic Vandals a lot more aggressively, I do think your red deck can keep up with the, the faster decks. So I think drafting mono red is a very viable strategy. I just hate doing it. The the one deck that I had good success with, um, I actually drafted it on the stream uh, with my buddy Woodrow, who I'm actually going to bring on the show in just a little bit. Uh, we're going to do for, for the, oh, the, draft. The, the Wood Elemental, the Wood Elemental himself. Uh, he's in the building and uh, we're going to bring him on as, uh, you know, players two, three and four to our right. Um, but we drafted a mostly green, almost mono green ramp deck. And, you know, I've been kind of off of the elves, Luis, like I, I, in the uh, legacy cube. I, I like drafting an elf. I'm actually quite a big fan of it. Um, I just consider them the mocks, you know, for, for that cube, but here, eh, not so much. I, I don't draft the, the elves quite as often because I usually just take signets instead. Well, this time I decided to take both. So this deck had a full four one drop mana elves and a full four signets and a sylvan carry added <laughs> and a coalition relic and a thran dynamo. <laughs> so this thing could make serious amounts of mana and, uh, and really put together some crazy top end stuff. And for the top end, the, the premier card, I think, was Genesis Wave, um, which if you can, you know, get it off for, you know, 10, 11, 12, uh, it's, it's hard to lose the game at that point. Um, but we also had Ulamog, uh, the infinite gyre. So the, the old one. Um, so that one, you know, he, he's really good to ramp into at 11 mana as well. And we had tooth and nail to put in Ulamog plus something else, which is pretty good. And then the other thing that I look for when I have a lot of signets, Luis, expels, right? Now I said Genesis wave, but we also had mind twist. We draft a lot of mind twists. That card is not very fair when you play like a signet and an elf or whatever, and just wipe out their hand on the third turn of the game. Um, and then we also splashed for secure the waste, um, along with Marari's wake. But I, you know, I couldn't quite tell, like we, we knew we wanted another place to dump copious amounts of mana, which we were sure to make. Um, and so we decided to go for the secure the waste. I don't know if it held its on. We, we never really got a chance to play it. Um, so I'm not sure where I, where I sit on secure the waste still. Um, I, have you, have you played much with that? Like in the rampy decks? I think it's it's a fine splash, but you're just not gonna have to be white all that often. Yeah. So I'm, I, I've really only played with it in one of my uh, Esper Prison decks, which it was not good. <laughs> <laughs> your shameful Esper Prison. <laughs> Look, you know, you you've got to try. Like 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 yeah. uh. Like I've said before, you you miss all the shots you don't take. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, and then you know I will say that I think the true all star for this deck it was Winter Orb, because when you've got four elves, five two mana mana makers, a three mana and a four mana mana maker, uh, Winter Orb just doesn't affect you that much, and it is so brutal on your opponent when they like have five lands and they're like tap 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 play something big and they think that they're doing pretty good. And then you're like winter orb takes the next, take the next three or four turns off. Right. And that is mean, especially when it's just completely not affecting you. Right. When you're yeah. the one who gets to just untap all your stuff. Definitely. Winter's orb is, is very, very good. Oh, you would, I can't believe you just did that. <laughs> oh, what he's loving that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm agreeing with your assessment of the card. Yeah, no, I know it's exactly what you just did. <laughs> Um, all right. Uh, did you draft any BFC this week before, uh, we kind of move things over to the, um, I did to I, the I, other topic. So I did a farewell, uh, draft and it, and honestly, I've been drafting a lot of BFC lately. So the, 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 the kind of the decks that I fought, felt myself falling into, there's three main decks, blue, red, devoid, blue, black, devoid, and blue, white flyers kind of in that order too. Blue, red, devoid is just the one I draft the most often, you know, and I think I realized one of the reasons is that Valakut Invoker has just been so good for me. Oh, yeah? That card's really jo- jumped up for you? Yeah, I, I always just want one or two Valakut Invokers in my deck because, first of all, it works really, really well with Kozilek's Channeler, which is a card I also love. Second of all, just it feels like you, you, you purchased Flood Protection. You 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 know, yeah. you know 
you paid three mana for a two three, which is not a great deal. But your flood insurance policy kicks in whenever you, you draw too many lands. And when you get to eight, eight mana and you start, you know, lightning bolting things for three damage, the card is just awesome. So I, 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 you know, without fail, just see a seventh pick Valak Invoker. I'm like, well, I'm in. And, and then, so you've been moving in on red, blue, primarily. You said. Yeah, red, blue, because blue is open. Uh, so I, I start with blue, and then and then I get the late Valak Invoker. So red is also blue, open. blue is just open. <laughs> I mean, you're just giving me that. Well, <laughs> like I'll take it, but. So I I do I will admit that uh, I have somewhat fallen into a trap of my own design here. One of the ones we talked about actually in that episode of the biggest traps in limited, which is lava ball I just, trap. I, I, I that is the biggest trap in limited. That's just <laughs> factual, but. I like the blue cards in Battle for Zendikar, and I think for good reason. Blue, I think, is the best color by a fair margin. But I like the blue cards so much that it's I value them at a rate which means I'm in blue a lot. Not every single time, but let's just say more than any other color and also more than I should be. I even know that. I just like drafting blue, and therefore I end up with in it at a higher rate than I think I should if I were just trying to solely maximize win percentage. So no, it's funny. I, I'm in the same boat, but I just feel like I'm right where I, where I, right well, where I should it, be. It, like, I think forcing it, blue almost is, is correct somehow. It, it does seem like it. And it, I always find reasons to be there. I just feel like if I took a step back, maybe I would draft blue a little bit less, but honestly, it is just the best color. And look, even it's bad cards are good. Even it's like tightening coils or just terminates. And it just has like so many premier commons like Sky Spawner, Clutch, and uh, Benthic Infiltrator are all just such great cards. And then, you know, Mist Intruder is just perfect for some of the decks that are good. It, it's just, it's really hard to go wrong drafting blue. So I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same. I, I'm on a blue tear when it comes to that set as well. Though I haven't drafted it. I, I drafted it right up until the cube came out and then I kind of switched over. Um, I Like I said, I think I was just kind of ready for for some cube action, but I, I will go back and draft BFC. You know, we talked about it before uh, a couple of shows ago, but man, it's really kind of held my attention. Uh, you know, for thinking I, I would not have expected that. I think uh, I thought maybe it would be one of those ones that got a little weird and I was like, yeah, okay, I'm kind of over this, but that hasn't been the case. I've uh, I'm still drafting it. I'm still liking it. All right. Um, crack a draft. Yeah, let's crack a draft. All right. So let's bring in my buddy, Woodrow. Now, for those of you that watch my stream, you'll know Woody. He's uh, he's a close friend of mine from the Seattle area here, and he's a, a poker and magic player just like me. So, you know, him and I have a lot in common. And uh, Woody's over at my place because uh, Tim Willoughby refused to fly over from England uh, to do the Cracker Draft. Uh, so instead we get Woodman. Woodrow, how goes, sir? How's it going? The, uh, the Wood Elemental. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Woody, what you're going to be doing here is you're going to be helping us with our crack a pack. And uh, we've got, um, I've got the names of the people that, that donated these particular packs. We've got Darcy, uh, Johnny, Kevin, and uh, Dave from BC. Kevin, I don't know where he's from, but I met Johnny at GP Indian Darcy at uh, Grand Prix Quebec City. So thank you uh, for those. Uh, that is much appreciated. And uh, it means that we get to do things like this. So what we're going to do is um, you and I, Luis, are in our seat. And then we've got them alphabetical going away from us. So, so Woody, who who's uh, who's in seat two? In other words, the person directly to our right. Uh, Darcy's in seat two. And then the next one. Uh, that is Johnny. Johnny, and then Kevin's in the last seat. Yeah. Okay. And so what Woodrow's going to do is he's basically going to put himself in each of those players. Uh, minds and take their picks as if they were individual players seated at a draft table. And then he's going to pass us those packs and we're going to go four picks deep into this draft and see, uh, see what we come up with. Again, this was based on, we've done these a few times before and people really seem to like them. So let's get into this. So Woody, you can go ahead and start okay. doing your packs and Woody can hear us, but he's been instructed to, to, uh, completely ignore us here. Um, all right, so here's what we have, Luis. He's oper operating under the same rules that I am. Which is, blue is open? <laughs> no, I can hear you, but I've been under instructions to ignore you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, so first card is Claustria Healer, you know, the one in a black, one, two. Vampire yeah, Cleric. I, I know what the card does. Ally, etc. Yes, we know that you do, but people ask that we read them more often. Um, anyway. I, I mean, I'm in for that, by the way. It, I, yeah, I, it's I, fine. It's, I, so I it's, can imagine. I, I mean, I've... I can imagine, in, you know, listening or, or, or watching and, you know, like coverage or listening to a podcast when you don't know what the card does and you're just 
makes the whole thing irrelevant. So yeah, I mean, I like the idea. Like the the idea made sense to me to skip over them at some point um, because we don't want to drag out the crack a pack too far every show. But at the same time, it's such a small thing to do, and if somebody's new, you know, it's important. Luis and I, for both, you know, we really think that it's important to keep the show open to to new players as well. Even though the subject matter is often a little bit more advanced than a new player, we want to make sure that this is a place that new players can come and feel comfortable, and, and this is an easy way to do it. So anyway, Cluster Healer is the one with the rally trigger um that drains your opponent for one life um funny thing uh you know if you would have told me that that i would consider first picking this card at the beginning of the set i would have said very unlikely um but i totally would you know uh i'm I'm hoping to find something better but claustra healer is absolutely a linchpin to you know a pretty darn good archetype in the format the black white life gain deck and uh i would actually consider first picking it you know it's funny i i would have said that a couple weeks ago but Mm -hmm. The more I draft BFC, the less I or the, I've noticed that I draft Black White Life Gain. I just never get into this deck, so I I, I don't think I would take Cluster Healer here. See, that's funny. Uh, I don't either because it's not blue, and blue leaves you open to go into multiple different decks where this card sh- uh, shoehorns you into one. And yes, I no, you do have a shoehorn, right? I have multiple shoehorns. <laughs> but I want to make it clear that you do not have a shoehorn. I don't have a shoehorn. <laughs> um, but anyway, you know, but but this is one of the archetypes that I actually will play um, outside of that. Uh, Reclaiming Vines. Do I have to read this? You, you do not because it's not a playable card. What right. We, yeah. It's just out. It, it's the 2GG Sorcery, Destroy Trigger, Artifact, Enchantment, or Land. Those have never really been playable. Um, Salvage Drone. Hey, here's a blue card I will not play. Uh, blue, 1-1, one, one, Devoid, Ingest, and when it dies, you loot. You too? Really? What is going on here? I've got Woody on my couch opening packs for the good of the game, and now you're just randomly cracking a pack over there? No, no that was just Woody. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know. Look, I've got headphones on. I know what's going on. What did you get? <laughs> I got a Dragon Master, okay. <laughs> Which means if we were doing a crack a crack a pack, I would just take it. You would just take it and we would move on. Yeah. Um, so Salvage Drone, I have found unplayable. So, I refuse the, to play this card. I think it's terrible. The thing I terrible. like most about Salvage Drone, this is a one blue for a 1-1. One, one, I hope you say the artwork or something. In, in jest, and then when it uh, dies, you can draw a card and then discard a card. Is that my opponent sometimes plays it against me. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and then I feel like my opponent took a mulligan because this card just doesn't do enough to justify inclusion in any deck. So just don't play the card. Yeah, it is the lowest impact. Um, and, and, you know, like we kind of glossed past, skipped over reclaiming wins. It's fine. I want to mention Salvage Zone because I've played against this card numerous times in the last week. You just don't want to put this card in your deck. And I don't know why people keep doing it. No, it, it actually fits the description of I think it was actually one of the traps, right? Which is the the one drop. Like yeah, we, it's, we it's use a one the flyer, mana one but... one with a minor upside that yeah. people just love. They they just love these cards. Oh, they love them. <sighs> look look it, at all those keywords. It, if if <laughs> if a third of what I do on this show is just tell people not to play these cards, then I think I'd have a positive effect on people's right. one percentage. <laughs> Agree. Uh, Swarm surge is next. Two and a black for a sorcery with devoid and creatures you control get plus two plus zero oh, until end of turn. That that affects all of them, um, but the colorless ones also get first strike until end of turn. Yeah, Swarm Search is is a decent finisher. It, it's one of the cards we mentioned as being better than we initially thought, which yeah, I believe it is. Mm-hmm. We initially thought it was crap, and it's actually solid. But it does require the right deck, and not every deck is going to play a Swarm Search. And you, I want to pick, pick these bad boys up real late. You, know, you you want to pick you want to wheel these because that indicates that your deck is a little bit more open. You want to be in the like either black green or blue black uh, or black red. Uh, all Eldrazi deck. It's really hard to get a black white Eldrazi deck because there's no white Eldrazi. So, the, yeah. basically, black X aggressive with lots of Eldrazi, and then uh, and then you know, Storm Surge becomes a card. Yeah, feels like it would go in the uh, in the black green deck that kind of never really comes together. Um, ooh, here's one Nettle Drone. That's the two and a red three one with Devoid. You can tap it to do a damage to your opponent, and uh, whenever you cast a color spell, you get to untap it. No drone is very good. It's yeah, a it's card. I, it's a card I, I like first picking, and in general, I'm happy. In, I'm happy to have in my deck. It, it just so, it just adds up so quickly in a you know half or more devoid deck, and it's especially good in black red just because black red's already naturally aggressive. Red blue is controlling enough that I don't. I don't think it's like the most critical card, but you always play it and you're always happy with it. Yeah, you're not cutting it, but it's not like super important. Uh, Fortified rampart, one and a white for the O six defender. This is another uh, somewhat underrated card just because it's one of the best two drops for blue-white flyers. Mm-hmm. 
because it's a two mana card that frequently stops a you know three to four mana card. Yeah. And yeah, I I like having a, a couple of these in in any blue white deck. I don't like it as much in white uh, white plus other colors, which is why I don't want to take it too early. But when you already blue white, this is, counts as a removal spell. It certainly does. I'm a fortified rampart fan. Uh, Life Spring Druid. That's the two and a green for a two one, and it taps to add any color of mana to your mana pool. Perfectly well, serviceable magic card, but just doesn't really have a home here. Yeah, it doesn't have a home mostly because cards with green mana symbols are, are a little bit riskier here than uh, you, you would like to have. Yeah, the story of this card, by the way, is, okay, so green ended up not being the strongest. In fact, it ended up being by far the weakest color in the set. Okay, fair enough. But the thing that popped out was, well, there's also this this sub-theme that you could maybe make a converged deck, right? And the Life Spring Druid seemed like it would fit into that. And the problem is... The converge cards ended up not being a big enough payoff to make to make it worth it, and thus Life Spring Druid, unfortunately, has never really you know been a thing that we need to uh, pick anywhere near this you know high. Uh, oh, here's your guy, Valkan Invoker. Oh, there we are. Now you now you so you take Nettle Drone, wheel the Invoker. That's two in a red for a two three. Pay eight mana to do three damage to anything. That that is a. Uh, uh, what what my plan would be here because as much as I said I love Valak Invoker, I was not saying I first picked Valak Invoker. No. I was just saying you would frequently get this card fifth through seventh and be, you know, happy to do so. And I just always want one or two in my deck. Yeah. That's good. Um Undo Great Horn. Yeah. Three. <laughs> <laughs> undo three, okay horn. <laughs> yeah. Three and a white for the two three. First strike with landfall plus two plus two. Again, this is just classically one of those cards that I still read and I still say those are reasonable stats, and I still just never end up playing this card. I agree. It just it doesn't fit into what the white decks want to do. The white yeah. decks the, the white decks I've had the most success with by far are the blue white flyer deck. And the black white life gain deck, though, as I mentioned, I haven't actually been drafting that recently. I I, I wonder if it's because people are just snapping up Clash to Healer first pick. So you're, you're part of the problem here. I could be. But even in like a red white allies deck, it's an allies deck. It's not an undo greathorn deck, and it, it just undo greathorn doesn't have a home. Yeah, he's homeless. Um, Dominator drone. Dominator drone is medium. It's is a two and a black for a three two. It's got ingest and it's devoid. And then when you play it, when it enters the battlefield, it, it, uh, your opponent loses two life if you control another colorless creature. It, you'll play this in black, red, devoid. You'll sometimes play it in blue, black just because it's three mana, three, two ingest is fine. But I'm really not excited about this card. Yeah. I, you know, I, it's gone up for me a little. I think I value it a little bit higher than most people do, but it's never high, high, high on the list. Um, I'm still on Nettle Drone out of this pack. Plated Crusher for GGG. For a seven six trample hex proof, whatever. I, you know, we, I, I, I like this card when I first saw it, and then too. I realized that it was just not really what this format was about. No, I mean it just seemed like a really good finisher, but again, it, it really does face the problem that uh, there's so many great colorless finishers available in the format that card like Crusher just goes down a lot. Um, adverse conditions three and a blue instant with devoid tap up to two target creatures. They don't untap on their next untap, and you get a one one scion. I am not a huge fan of Adverse Conditions. It's another one of the cards that's kind of on the list of when my opponent plays it, I'm like, all right, I'm up a card. Let's just see how this goes. Mm -hmm. Because it, you, you are down a card. You you basically got some Tempo and a Eldrazi Scion, which is generally not worth a card. So you really have to be aggressive to take advantage of this. If you're using this as a defensive measure, then it just, just it's not going to be very effective. Yeah, I I actually like this card in the in the aggressive tempo-y, especially flyers type decks. But otherwise, I, I don't end up playing it. Uh, Jotty offshoot, green for an O three defender, landfall, gain of life. Uh, you know, a constructed all star, but not, not really what you want. In limited <laughs> constructed all star. <laughs> It's a fine sideboard card. That's about it. Yeah, no, kind of out on the offshoot. All right, here's our rare. It is Painful Truths. So that's two and a black for a sorcery with Converge. You draw X cards and lose X life, where X is the number of colors of mana spent on it. Painful Truths is a good card. You it is really good. You want to be three colors, though, to take advantage of it. Cause yeah, how excited are you about the, the two mana option on it? Yeah, the two color option of two and a black. Or, excuse me, two color, yeah. Two in a black, draw two cards, lose two life. I'll basically always play it in a black deck, but it's not such a strong card that I'm really interested in first picking it. But if you can get to the third color? If I knew I would cast it at three colors like a little more than half the time, I'd be pretty excited about the card. Because three mana, draw three, lose three is 
very good if you're not getting beaten down. So that brings up the question then, like, would you expect to be able to do that in a black deck to be able to hit that third color very often? I would say a decent amount of the time you're going to want to splash just because I often find myself splashing if I picked up Pilgrim's Eye or Evolving Wilds, but I don't know that uh, that's over half the time. It's less than half the time, I would imagine. So I think given all, given that, my first pick is, is Nettle Drone here. Yeah, I'm on Nettle Drone also. No, um, you have to disagree. I, well, I would have, except for there was no blue card that was but I said it early. over it. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're on Nettle Drone, pack one, pick one. Yep. Now, before I pick up um, the pack that came to us from Darcy, mm-hmm. that that's uh, the player directly to our right, I want to ask Luis, um, and I, I think we should both check in here on where do we see this deck going ideally? What what are the options? What are the backup plans? Um, you know, what are we looking at uh, to go into the future with this pick as a, 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 after a nettle drone? Like, what's your ideal deck for this nettle drone? No, well, I mean, I, I still like drafting blue red if blue red's open, mm-hmm. but. I think one pick in is a little bit – this isn't such a committal card that I'm really worried about that. I I, I would like to be, you know, blue-red or blue, red-black Eldrazi because that's where Nettle Drone is the best. But I could be very, very easily just going to ignore the Nettle Drone and just take a white card and end up blue-white or something along those lines. Okay. Like I'm not I'm not super locked in. The, Nettle Drone is not such a good card that I put a high priority on making sure it ends up in my deck. I just think it's the best option of the cards we've seen. Yeah, I feel, I feel the same. Um, I do not disagree with you. All right, so let's so Darcy passes us her pack, and let's get into this. All right, um, they're still in order, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. So uh, first card out, Claustria Healer. So we just talked about that one. Um, Had we taken the other Claustria Healer, then this would be very appealing. Yes. But given that we didn't, it's it's much less so. No. Yeah. Uh, Blister Pot is next. Green for a one one with Devoid. When it dies, you get a one one. We we know that you play <laughs> this at least at the Grand Prix level. Yeah, I I, I, I have. You think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say I think it's great. I I, w- I would not. Well, you put what two of them in your deck at the Grand? I did put two of them in my it deck. It must be great. I can't. I had Vampiric else. Rites. It was good in that deck. Okay, fair. Um, so this though, at least I know for me, it it fits much closer into the spectrum of uh, a Salvage Drone, right? <laughs> like it's it's just the card that doesn't have enough impact, and it's also in green. So I'm not taking that. Oracle of Dust is four and a blue for a three five devoid, and you can pay two colorless and uh, and process a card to loot. Three like- five for five. You know it, the thing. It like this is my. <laughs> I play this guy right. Like it, 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 when you when you end up kind of veering hard towards blue most of the time, you play Oracle of Dust, and the guy's fine. He's okay. He he he, he does his thing. I don't know. I've always been like sure Oracle of Dust. Never exciting, but not that bad either. I like Oracle of Dust. I'll put it in my deck most of the times I draft it. But yeah, I, w- I have second picked it before. I've never been happy about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're definitely not second picking it. Um, Voracious Null, two and a black for a 2-2. Two, two. You can pay one and a black and sacrifice another creature to put two plus one plus one counters on it, but you can only do it at sorcery speed. No. no. Voracious, no. Um, Shatter Skull <laughs> Recruit, three red red for a 4-4 four, four Menace, and it's also uh, uh, an ally. Um, interesting in that it's also red, right? So, you know, all, all things being equal, we would take a red card if it was exactly tied on power level with something else. But the truth is, is that Shatter Skull Recruit is not, it's, it's just not one of the, the big pulls and it's not something that we're really looking to pick here. No, Core Castigator is uh, one and a white for a three, one, and it can't be blocked by Eldrazi Scions. It's also an ally. The red white ally deck has never impressed me. I, I have no interest in moving in for this card at all. Yeah, it. I, I hate red white so much. I don't know why, but I always lose when I draft red white. So I just really, I'm not a huge fan of it. I mean, I will draft it if that's what I'm supposed to be drafting in my seat, or at least to some degree, I, might, I can get forced into it. But I'm very unlikely to take a core castigator out of this pack. Same. Um, Ondu champion. Uh, another red card, two, two red red for a four three with rally. Everything gets trample, and it's also an ally. But I, yeah, I'm just that. This is again not the kind of card that a complements nettle drone particularly well, and b is just really up to the power level of what we hope to get out of a pack one pick two. Um, McKinney slide runner, uh, another there's constructed all star. Like mediocre red cards. There, there are a <laughs> lot of mediocre. We could definitely get one of these back. It's a one and a red for a two one with trample, and it's got landfall. It gets plus one plus one. I'm still off of it. I'm, I'm not wanting that. Um, all right. Now, here's one that, that actually catches can, can my we get, eye. Can we get a card? Uh, we got something. We got Gideon's Reproach. 
um, which right. is, yeah, fine, right? One in a white instant. Getting his approach deals four damage target attacking or blocking creature. I, I, in my white decks, I never cut those, so that's something. Ooh. So here's our first uncommon. It's turn against. Um, a card that has gone down, I think, in both of our estimations. Um, by the way, I predicted this. Um, I don't. I still think it's good, though. Uh, I still want a, a decent amount of games off of turn against just stealing their guy and attacking them with it. Or if they get a little sloppy, I can, you know, get the get the blowout, the two for one or whatever. Um, I still like turn against. Um, I just don't value it as highly as I thought I would when the set first came out. Agreed. It, it, it's f- so funny how these things go where we see turn against. Everyone's like, wow, this card's great, you know, because Rhea Command is great. And then very quickly it's like, well, it's kind of expensive. And people are like, no, this card's crap. And mm-hmm. it's like, well, no, it, it's it's really not. It's just not great. I do think that uh, in general, the card is not wonderful. But I I think you're gonna put in your deck a decent amount of the time. It's just it's not a great card. It's a card I like a lot less than say Gideon's Reproach, which I would prefer to take right here. Yeah, and, and, and even though Gideon's Reproach is white and turn against is red and colorless, right? You know, given fact, that we've got a nettle drone, like these things. Are, the fact that we have a nettle drone isn't super impactful in my decision here. Agree. Yeah. See, I'm the same. And and that's something that's really, I think a lot of people are like, well, we're red, turn against, take it. Like, it's just a no-brainer. Oh, hello, friend. Windrider Patrol. I do like Windrider Patrol. This is, <laughs> I do, too. <laughs> three blue blue for a 4-3 flyer, which is already pretty good. Then when it hits your opponent, you get to scry, too. So, it's I, basically uh, Ojitai, so. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's the Ojitai of BFZ. I, I, I'm a fan of Windrider Patrol. I, I would take that over Gideon's Reproach right I here. I would slam it here. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited. I mean, and we've still got a few more cards to go here as well. So um, our, well, oh, okay. So we've actually got two rares here. Um, one of them is a foil. Uh, the first one is Lumbering Falls. Um, you know, that's the dual land that makes blue and green, enters the battlefield tapped, and you can pay four mana to make it a 3-3 three, three elemental that's uh, got hexproof. I really like these lands, but I don't take them this early ever. Yeah. Um, like also, I the think. blue-green land is, yeah. is not, not really where you want to be. Sad land. Um, and then our other foil, though, is a, is a rare, and it's a card you can play. It's Noyan Dar Royal Shaper. So that's the three white-blue for a 4-4, four, four, and he's a legendary merfolk ally. Something that pops up occasionally, too. And whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, you get to awaken a land with three counters on it. Um, I like Windrider Patrol here. Um, And the other thing that we need to consider here, Luis, is... So we've got the two rares, but then our uncommons were Windrider Patrol and Turn Against. Now, this pack was pretty strong, right? Like Gideon's Reproach, Windrider Patrol. There is a uncommon missing from this pack. Now, for me, that... I'm narrowing it down to two cards, right? I'm I'm thinking Rolling Thunder and I'm thinking uh, uh, Grip of Desolation. Those are the two cards that jump out to me as the two cards like that I would take over, say, a Windrider Patrol, for example. Uh, people tend to like Noyandar. I, I think the gold aspect of it makes it so that it's not so hot, you know. But like again, Gideon's Reproach, really solid little card too. So those are the two cards that jump to mind. There may be others that that somebody might take, um, but those are the ones that kind of are in my head about what we might be, you know, color wise, what we might be seeing from the other side. Well, what, what do you think when you when you hear that one uncommon's missing and there's some decent rare and another? I, there, there's a number of uncommons. This could be Grip of Desolation, Rolling Thunder, or you know, Stasis Snare are all cards which I find very believable. Stasis Snare, yeah, that's good too, yeah. I, I think I would just take Noyandar here. Yeah, you're not going to play it in the same deck as Nettle Drone, but that's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Noyandar is a very good card, and getting past Noyandar is also relevant. You, the person to your right knows that they passed a Noyandar. And... I think that it's worth just seeing where things go from here. Like taking Noyandar and if, yeah, maybe blue-white isn't open. You don't end up blue-white. That's fine. Maybe you end up back in red. But I think Noyandar is enough better than the next best option, like Windrider Patrol, that I would rather just have the Noyandar. So that's interesting because I actually think that they're pretty close, all, all told. Um, I think that the chance that I play a Windrider Patrol in my deck is higher than a Noyandar. I think that Noyandar is more powerful than Wind Rider Patrol, but not by a lot. Uh, I think it's, you know, conditionally decent. But I think I would take the Wind Rider Patrol out of the pack here. I I think that taking Wind Rider Patrol is playing it a little too safe. Like, yes, you get to put, put it in your deck alongside Nettle Drone, but 
I, I think this early in the draft, I just take the better card, which is why I would take And you think card. it's that much better? That's the real question. I think it's a reasonable amount better. I think if, okay. the thing is, if you end up playing Noindar in a blue-white deck, which is where, where it ends up, yeah. blue-white decks tend to have a decent amount of spells. That and is cards, true. cards like Anticipate get a lot better. And I already like Anticipate, for example. No, that's true. And Noindar, I've seen this card take over the board state where Windrider Patrol is always solid, but you know, not necessarily on that level. Um I think where we disagree is in the difference between the power level of the two cards. And I think it's narrower than you do. So that's why I would take the Wind Rider Patrol because I feel like I'm not giving up very much by uh, shipping Noyandar. All right. So we'll keep that in mind. Um, I've, I've taken both of them here so we can kind of, you know, work things through. Um, since we're only going four picks deep, it shouldn't mess it up too badly here. Um, so this is from Johnny. All right. So Johnny, of course, is two seats away from us. So let's see what we get out of the pack from Johnny. So first card is Dutiful Return. That's the three and a black sorcery return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. I have sideboarded that card in. I've never picked it early. I always take that card thinking I'm going to sideboard it in, and I never do. So at this point, I, do, I think it's just not a card I'm going to play in this format. <laughs> You're just out, yeah. <laughs> uh, Swell of Growth. Um, one and a green for an instant. Creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. You can put a land from your hand onto the battlefield. No. No, no, no. no. Uh, cliffside Lookout. So it's white. For a 1-1, and you can pay 4 and a white to give your team plus 1, plus 1 until in turn it's also an ally. No. No, no, no. Now, interesting, like, th- this kind of card still doesn't catch your eye, even though you took Noyandar here, right? Uh, I don't like Cliffside Lookout in the blue-white deck, so no, yeah. I'm not really looking to do that. All right, Natural Connection, a card that you've hated since day one. <laughs> Two, I, still, I still don't think it's particularly good. No, it's so true. Part of that was just because of how bad green was. It wasn't necessarily how bad Natural Connection was. I see. Guilt by association. Yeah, two two and a green for an instant, and it's giant growth, or uh, rampant growth. You get to search your library for a basic land and put it on the battlefield tapped. Nope. A Natural Aggression. You got you you and I are both off of this card real hard, and also it's green. It's a, the instant fight card for two and a green, so No. Geyser Field Stalker. Wow, this pack's a lot worse. Um, oh, yeah. So four and a black for a three, two with Menace and Landfall plus two, plus two. Now this card's like basically not playable. All right, here's one. Here's Cloud Manta. All right, I like Cloud Manta. Three yeah. and a blue for a three, two flyer. It's just, just a fine card. And I think no, both of us are on this page no matter what, what our second pick was here. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, Sandstone Bridge. You know, I just don't play any of these except for the green one and occasionally the black one now. This is the uh, Enters the Battlefield tapped white land, uh, the ta- land that uh, taps for white, excuse me. And the creature, you can have a target creature get plus one, plus one in Vigilance until end of turn. Are you playing these this cycle still? I, like I said, I play the green one pretty consistently and occasionally the black one makes it and none of the rest do for me. If you're aggressive, the red and the white ones are both okay. Okay. In The blue one is just so so medium. I, I generally don't... I don't pick these very highly, and and often I won't even play them. So, yeah, I'm not a huge fan. Okay. Um, Slab Hammer. This is a card that's gone up for a lot of people. Oh, I got to tell you a story about this, too. So it's two colorless <laughs> mana for an equipment. You can equip for two, and the equip creature attacks. You can return a land to your hand. You may. If you do, the creature gets plus two, plus two. Uh, that's a cool turn. story. <laughs> so my opponent at FNM, um, my deck was great. You know, I just thought, oh, I'm never going to lose. And, in fact, I didn't. But... My opponent assembled a combo that I hadn't seen yet that was really cool. It was Retreat to Coral Helm. Mm-hmm. So that's the blue retreat. And one of the modes on blue retreat is landfall. Uh, you can tap or untap target creature. Then Skyline Cascade. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. the blue one. The blue one that ta- that says target creature doesn't untap during a st- controller's next untap step. And Slab Hammer. <laughs> so... When you when you play Skyline Cascade and you've got Retreat to Coral Helm out, you can stack the trigger so that you're like, okay, tap that thing down, and now it doesn't untap. And he could do that repeatedly every turn. He just got to lock down one of my creatures, and the thing he's attacking with is getting him plus two, plus two, so it was pretty big. And, Build your uh, own Frost Titan. Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. I was like, oh, you know, props. And, and it made it much more of a game than I thought it would be, but as it turned out, I had enough, like, uh, clutch occurrence and bounce spell type things to make the slab hammer really clunky. And it turns out when you do return a land every turn and you play, put it back into play tapped every turn, you're not developing your mana in a meaningful way. So it kind of limits the type of spells you can actually cast. But anyway, um, slab hammer, I know a lot of pros actually think this card's quite good. I almost never play it. Um, I don't think it's that good. Um, I think it does some, some decent things, but again, this could be, 
you know, what did we, we talked about what card was it a minute ago? Sandstone Bridge and the red version and being good in aggressive decks. I just don't play that many aggressive decks in the format. So maybe that's why I'm not as high on Slab Hammer. I, I've been impressed with Slab Hammer. I, I will admit the card has done 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 the job that it's trying to do, which is kill your opponent fairly effectively. It doesn't fit into a lot of the decks I'm drafting because I'm trying to play you know six plus mana spells. Slab mm-hmm. Hammer's not good at those. But when you're drafting an aggressive red deck, Slab Hammer really does just kill your opponent. Okay. Uh, Retreat to Korra Homes actually in this pack. We could combo. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a blue enchantment, landfall. Uh, the first one I already mentioned. The second one is you could scry one. Never played it. I think this card's bad. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's particularly playable. Um, Though, funnily enough, that was one of the cards that had a very high win percentage in the like analytics when someone ran all those games. But oh. I think that's just because there's so few uh, retreats played, and then just they happen to win. Like the people who played them happen to win some games. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Rising Miasma is our last uncommon. We've got a foil again. It's a common. Uh, but Rising Miasma is uh, three and a black. All creatures get minus two, minus two until it turns to sorcery, and you can awaken three for five black, black. This card varies wildly in how good it is. It is a main deckable card. Do you main deck it? I think you do. I think you should should main deck this card. I I don't. I always sideboard it. Am I being too conservative there? Yeah, I would rather just have it in the main deck. I'm not in love with it. It's... It's the sort of thing where if your deck's good enough, you can cut it. But in general, I think you should probably main deck it. Oh, that so you're saying s- I just draft awesome decks all the time and don't <laughs> need it? Is that what you're... That's unlikely to be the actual case, but <laughs> I I don't think that either of us is picking this here, though. No, we're not. Uh, our last card is a foil. That's right, Valakid Invoker, <laughs> your guy. <laughs> now, we're both taking Cloud Manta out of this pack, right? Yeah, we, we are. It's not a very exciting third pick, but again, these packs have been pretty low power level, which... Mm-hmm. Is fine. You're again. You're drafting a deck that has to play against other people at the table. So, if the packs are all bad, then everyone's deck should presumably be not as good. But you just hope the other side of the table has equally bad packs. Now, given that you, your uh, setup right now looks like Nettle Drone, Noyandar, and then Cloud Manta, would you consider the Invoker? Like, is that on the same page as Ma- Manta for you? No, I, I think. Man, I think Manta's a slightly better card to take third pick regardless, and I, I think that uh, I'm more likely to be blue, blue-white than I am to be red. Right. Though uh, I, I do think taking either card is fine. I would take the Manta here, though. Okay, so that's it. And and my deck looks pretty similar. My deck is Nettle, Drone, Windrider, Patrol, Cloud Manta. Yours has no Indar instead of the Windrider Patrol. All right, so this is our last pack. This one comes from Kevin, who, again, started off three seats away from us. And uh, this is our fourth pick, so let's see what we get here. Wow. Right off the top one, I really like Myers Malice. This one I do main deck. Uh, three and a black sorcery target opponent discards two card and it has awaken three for five and a black. I, I'm a huge Myers Malice fan in this format. Yeah, Myers Malice has impressed me over and over again. It's a card that I always play and it's a card that I frequently lose to. So I'm, I'm a big fan. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Um, Boiling Earth. That's the one in a red sorcery. Uh, it does one damage to each creature your opponents control and it's got awaken four. So it's a 4-4, four, four, but it's for 7 mana, 6 in a red. This is another card which has impressed me. It turns out all the Awakened cards are just good. Yeah. <laughs> Th- that kind of flexibility is really nice. Yeah. I'm not slamming either of these cards, hopefully, but th- these cards are both fine. Yeah. Uh, McKinney Patrol, that's a 2 and a white for a 2-3. Uh, it's an ally, and it has Rally for Vigilance. Now, looking at your picks here, you've got Noyandar, Cloud Manta, McKinney Patrol. I, I'm not a huge fan of McKinney Patrol. Like I, McKinney I, would, Patrol. I would rather not take that here. Okay. Uh, Ruin Processor. Ooh, I like Ruin Processor. Yeah, so seven colors for a 7-8. It's an Eldrazi Processor. When you cast it, you can process a card and gain five life. But really, it's a seven mana, 7-8 seven, with some upside. And uh, it turns out 7-8 is bigger than almost everything. Um, and, I'm a, and I'm a the, fan. The upside is very real. It's not hard to have a deck that totally. has just a couple ways to exile, and gaining five life is a, is a big game. So I, I really like Ruin Processor. This is the card I've taken. You know, we've only seen a couple of cards, but this is the card I've taken so far. Uh, Skyline Cascade, we talked about that. That's the the Enters the Battlefield tap land for blue that tap, keeps a creature tap. Now, uh, Eyeless Watcher in green, three and a green for a 1-1 one, one that brings two 1-1 one, one Scions with it. It's colorless. Now, right, I mean, we're just off of green at this point anyway. I, don't uh, here, think there, I, I generally don't think there's a good reason to draft green in this format. And certainly not when you started with three non-green cards. Right. Uh, Rush of Ice. The, the uh, bad clutch. The, the, this is the bad clutch. This taps right. down a creature and it doesn't untap for a turn for one blue. And then you, it has awakened for five total as a 3-3. Three, three, yeah. Which 
Yeah, it, it's a it's a card I played it. I play I don't know a little less than half the time. It's it's fine. It's just not great. Yeah, I'll do it, man. If it means I get to play blue, I'll play a rush of ice. But yeah, it's definitely not great. Uh, Silent Skimmer, card that went down a bit for me. I kind of liked it at first, and then I it fell off a little. The three and a black O four flying devoid creature, and uh, when it attacks, the defending player loses two life. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, Expedition Envoy. So, Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, Silent Skimmer is just a fine card. It's not. It's, it's just not okay, right? Great. Yeah. Um, Expedition Envoy is a 2 1 uh, ally for white, which is no. I, I, I hate Expedition Envoy. Or, uh, I'd rather I hate playing it. It just never does enough for me. No, me too. Uh, here we go. Blighted Gorge. Interesting one. That's the uh, the the Blighted Cycle, the red version. So it, it taps to add colorless mana to your mana pool. It's a land. And you can pay four and a red tap it and sack it to have it do two damage to a creature or player. Yeah, uh, you nope. know, bl- blighted George, as I like to like to call it. Uh, it's <laughs> it's it's a fine card. We 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 were pretty high on them in the set review, and then kind of I think d- scaled back our ratings when we realized there's just a lot to do with a lot of mana, like cards like set rune processors that cost seven, make make cards like blighted uh, gorge a lot less impressive. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> What, the, what is going on? Our last card is another foil Valakan invoker. <laughs> <laughs> this card is just totally following you around. Woody, Woody heard our pre to pre show role here. And yeah. just like did you hear that, Wood? I, I did hear that. It was pretty. I, when I <laughs> did you set this up? How no, I started, I started opening the bags. I just thought, well, this is, this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think that uh, I know I'm on Ruin Process. I think you are too for this pack, right? Definitely. I, the, I think I w- the best card in the pack is Myers Malice, but uh, but I'm not I'm not near that currently, so I'm going to take Ruin Processor here. I I, I like Ruin Processor. I th- I always want to have one or two in my deck anyway, and this is as good of a time to take it as any. It also doesn't really commit you because you know I have a red card, a blue white card, a blue card, and a now a colorless card, and you have a red card, two blue cards, and a colorless card. Mm-hmm. I think either of us could go in any direction here. Yeah, pretty much. If if our next pack had a really powerful black card. Like, let's just say, for some reason, a grip of Desolation was still mm-hmm. black. That's sure. very unlikely. But if it was there, or, or even even something uh, like Complete Disregard. If Complete Disregard is, in our, is the best card in our next pack, I, and the next best card is something very mediocre, I could see either of us taking it and just seeing what develops. So no, totally. I think Rune Processor really helps support that. Yeah. All right. So let's think about this as we kind of wind down here, Luis. Um, what are we thinking is going on to the right, right? We've got a few data points here to grab. We talked about it in our episode about signals, right? And this is, you, you got an idea for kind of how Luis and I start to form our deck, you know, a little bit of preferences the other way. Like I took a little more conservative route and took just the blue card. Luis said, well, I'm going to go for it and take the, the blue, white, gold card because I think it has enough upside. But what we also said in that episode mainly was, well, what, what are the people to our right doing? You know, what are Darcy, Johnny, and Kevin up to? And, and we're going to get to hear that from from Woody in just a minute as he's going to tell us what, what cards they, they have in their piles right now. But what are you thinking about it? Like, what colors do you feel are open or not? Um, well, you know, D- D- Darcy is drafting blue, black, devoid. Uh, you're, Johnny's you're just drafting. <laughs> Johnny's drafting. No, I, I, I have no idea. Like, Right. That's the key is that we don't know for hey, sure. This early into the draft, you – first of all, you, you don't – you shouldn't – think you know what signals are. Second of all, don't worry that you don't know exactly what's going on. Like, yes, if you got a third pick grip of desolation, that's a signal. That that pretty much guarantees the two people to your right are not playing black, because or at least it's very, very unlikely. It doesn't guarantee, but it's very unlikely. Mm-hmm. Getting past Annoyandar is a sign. It's not it's not a you know definition by any any stretch. Like Darcy could be playing white blue despite passing Noyandar. Like it, it, that is a very plausible thing. Or mm-hmm. it's just less likely. And especially because it was a foil Noyandar or whatever, yeah. But in general, what you see picks like, you know, around five through eight are a little bit more uh, important than what you see in the first couple. Because in the first couple, there can just be three good blue cards and you get one third. It's not a signal. Yeah. Pick seven, if you see a, a good blue card, then that's much more of a signal. Okay. Well, yeah, it felt to me like the white cards, the good white cards weren't really coming through. The only one we saw was the... Um was the uh, Gideon's Reproach was the only one that stood out. And then I'm really curious to see what that uncommon was that Darcy took. So let's let's start with Darcy. So okay. the, the player directly to our right, and let us know what Darcy I'm picked. I'm guessing up. Grip of Desolation. Uh, Darcy took Grip of Desolation. Yeah, so it, was, it was a really powerful pack. 
Uh-huh. You know, I mean, obviously, like Wind Rider Patrol is quite good. Yeah. And Noyandar is actually a, a rare that I would probably first pick, but with an option, with a monocolored option, as good as Grip, I just went with that. Yeah. yeah. Grip, Grip's the best card in the pack and single colors. That's, I, I think, a pretty clear pick. Uh-huh. Right. Um, and so do you want to uh, do you want to go over all the first picks? Here for... uh, no, I don't want to. Go. I just want to give us an idea of what the players are doing. So you can just tell us the three cards that Darcy ended up gotcha. with. Gotcha. So, so then uh, Darcy was passed that that bad pack that you guys were looking at yeah second pack and the only card in it that was even reasonable was a nettle drone although uh darcy did tank a little bit on whether or not to take rising miasma because uh-huh, it's a, black it's a card i haven't played with a, a a ton i know that it can be really good in in situations like that i first picked a black card so i considered taking it but i just felt like nettle drone was strong enough that and it, this is early enough that i should just take the better card mm-hmm. agree and, and then the last pack um that was passed was just kind of a snap pick because there was a complete disregard in it. Oh, so, yeah. So uh, super yeah. easy. Um, yeah. So Darcy has a better deck. Than so Darcy's doing pretty good, good for herself. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well played, Darcy. Now, what about uh, Johnny? So John... Now, John op- Johnny's only got two two picks here, but... Right. So jo- Johnny opened that weak pack that you guys uh-huh. that you guys were looking at. Was there and, something real spicy in it for Johnny? Yeah. Or? So jo- Johnny kind of... <laughs> he kind of hit the reverse lotto where he, he uh, had a weak pack where... The the best card was the rare, and the rare also happens to have a green mana symbol in it. So, uh, it was tough. That that pack had all of the cards that you looked at, where you guys ended up taking Cloud Manta plus Nettle Drone and Kiora Master of the Depths. Ah. So, so um, I considered actually, like, I tried to put myself in the the mentality of this is like a, a day two draft at a GP. Yeah. And I even considered taking the Nettle Drone over it, but. It felt like Kiora was powerful enough that you could kind of speculate early. And also, you know, as green is such an underdrafted color right now, like maybe maybe it is a good thing to go into for something this powerful. Like maybe you can just be the green guy. At the table. Well, and you know Johnny. He loves his yeah. green <laughs> Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Johnny ended up pick, taking the Kiora. And then he got shipped a pack uh, where he was tanking between uh, the uh, a breaker of armies which I thought was a better pick than this early, a better pick than uh, the Ruin Processor, which you guys took out of the pack. And that pack also had that complete disregard in it that the Darcy ended up getting. So so you would have to have taken Cura into complete disregard in, to take it? Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so you've already got a gold card, and you're, gonna, you're assuming if you're playing green and blue that you're probably going to be playing the... You know the the multicolor you know conversion. Yeah, you deck. probably won't be stopping at green blue. Right. So so you are kind of looking for powerful cards that you want to splash. But I thought you know with a with a colorless option this good probably would just take that stay safe. And so and so Johnny though thinks that Breaker of Armies is better than Ruin Processor. Um, I, I just I find that you have more or less you know you have less opportunities to take a Breaker of Army and it, and it does a specific thing to the game state. And, you know, you don't want a ton of 8 and 7 drops in your deck. And it feels, at least I felt in my experience, you can kind of pick up a Ruin Processor mm-hmm. at some point in the draft. Oh, so. yeah, that is true. They, yeah. they, do, they do come around. All right. And then that leaves us with Kevin? Uh, yes. Oh, oh, one other note. Yeah, I also uh-huh. thought that um, uh, what's, uh, Ruin Processor would not be very good in a blue-green deck, right? Because you're, okay. Yeah. Because you're, you're never going to get anything exiled anyway. Right. Uh, so, yes. Um, <laughs> Kevin. So, Kevin had a tough... Tough choice. Uh, Kevin opened uh, a pack, and, and the two cards that he was tanking between were Barrage Tyrant and the Complete Disregard. Oh, okay. Um, complete Disregard's pretty safe. It's just always good. Barrage Tyrant takes a little bit more setup cost, but it like when it's ever whenever it's been played against me, it's been kind of a groaner. You know, like you have to kind of spend all of your time thinking about whether or not Barrage Tyrant can kill you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, it often can. Yeah. So it's a good I just, card. I decided to snap it off. There weren't a ton of super good red cards in the pack. Um, I think... Valakut Invoker? <laughs> yeah, there, there was, there's a Valakut Invoker in every pack. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess uh, we didn't have a Nettle Drone in it because the Nettle Drone was from the pack before. But yeah, it, 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 yeah, it was between those two cards and I ended up just going with the rare. Well, okay. So. D- Darcy still has the best deck. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I suppose it's a little less fair to what Johnny and Kevin because they don't have as many cards. But uh, <laughs> right, fair. But Darcy, but we have we have more cards, and our deck is still worse somehow. <laughs> yeah. Somehow. Yeah. Darcy is uh, seems to be in a good seat yeah, here. Darcy is slaughtering it so far. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that will do it for the uh, for the cracker draft. Woody, thanks for for taking the time to. Uh, to work those through for us. I know it can kind of be weird to take yourself out of the things that you know you're hearing us right. talk over here and you know all that, but uh, I yeah. appreciate you doing that. Cool.
Yeah, um, all right, Luis, let's call it a show, man. Sounds like that, a that was fun. We've I got I'm buried in Valakid invokers over here. I have to start sorting them through. But hey, all of these cards are going to go into the uh, into the next giveaway for our uh, for our Patreon subscribers. So that's cool. A lot of a lot of extra rares introduced into the into the pool, including a planeswalker. So I like that. Um, all right, but that will do it for the show this week. Um, we've got, uh, let's see. We have some amount of time until uh, GP Oakland, Luis. Um, if you want to get signed up for it, you need to go to gpoakland.com to do that. Um, you know, it's what, two weeks away or two and a half weeks away or something. So it's, it's coming two up weeks from quickly. this coming Saturday. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Um, of course, I want to remind you that the show is brought to you by channel fireball.com, the place to go to pick up anything that you need magic related. Uh, it could be singles. It can be sealed product. It can be t-shirts you know whatever it is that you happen to need they're going to have it there and of course you're going to find a full selection of awesome free content every single day at channel fireball uh if you want to find us on social media quite easy i am marshall underscore lr and Luis is lsv three easy litters luck skill and victory and you can uh, come say hi on twitter uh we certainly appreciate uh all the people that gave us feedback both on the lrcast subreddit and also uh via twitter and and uh and email as well uh, we're always looking to improve the show, and and that was a really helpful step. I think uh, you know, openly asking for it like that, and really getting a nice. Yeah, it was very smart. It it was a good play, Luis. You you do win that round. Uh, not not that I was <laughs> against it, but uh, but I do think that I'd argue with Marshall so much no, to get you permission didn't. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, Marshall we should do this, feedback. and I was like, yes, <laughs> great idea. And you're like, Whew, won that round. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, for all things limited resources, lrcast.com has links to everything, including the stuff I just talked about on here. Uh, I want to take a minute as well to to wish everybody happy holidays. Um, I know this is kind of a fun time of year for for a lot of our listeners where we get to kick back, relax, think about what happened Record during the course of the year. It's not Christmas Eve. <laughs> um, and, and, and just generally. I, actually, depending on where you are, it technically is Christmas Eve by now. It could be somewhere, yeah. Um, but, you know, it is a, a, a cool time of year. And, and looking back at the year, you know, we'll be doing some some things like that. But I just wanted to say thanks for another great year for Limited yeah. Resources. It, I mean, I, I joined the podcast like almost exactly a year ago now. My first uh, episode was this coming January was a year anniversary. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. I, I've loved it. I have no plans on going anywhere uh, unless uh, Marshall decides to not not renew my contract. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the, the contract of, hey, can I do this podcast? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that sounds cool. All right. Talk yeah. to you later. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've been having a lot of fun. Uh, uh, as I've always said, I love listening to what the community is has going on and, and it is saying. And yeah, I hope it, I hope we have another great year. Maybe uh, maybe next year we'll we'll get the ratings on the best card in the set a little bit better. But uh, I, I think besides Fate Reforged, we did a pretty good job on that too. I think so too. No no regrets, Luis. We we trudge forward <laughs> into the <laughs> into the unknown. All right, that is going to do it for the show this week. We will talk to you next week. On the first day of Christmas, my true love sent to me a warden of the first tree. On the second day of Christmas, my true love sent to me two turtle dubscapes and a warden of the first tree. On the third day of Christmas, my true love sent to me three thran lands, two turtle dubscapes and a warden of the first tree. On the fourth day of Christmas, my true love sent to me Four thrumming birds, three thran lands, two turtle dubscapes, and a warden of the first tree. <laughs> On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love sent to me five soul rings, four thrumming birds, three thran lands, two turtle dubscapes, and a warden of the first tree. <laughs> On the sixth day of oh, Christmas, yeah. my true love sent to me Don't stop now. six hunting moas a laying, five soul rings, four <laughs> thrumming birds, three thran lands, two turtle dubscapes, and a warden. Of the first tree. <laughs> On the seventh day of Christmas, my true love sent to me eight iron maids of milking seven. Or on Whoa. the seventh day of Christmas, my <laughs> true love sent to me seven swans of Bryn Orgola singing, six hunting boas a laying, five soul rings, four thrumming birds, three thran lens, two turtle dovescapes, and a warden of the first tree. On the eighth day of Christmas, my true love sent to me. Eight iron maids a milking, seven swans of Bryn Argola singing, six hunting moas a laying, five soul rings, four thrumming birds, three thran lands, two turtle dubscapes, and a warden of the first tree. 
on the ninth day of Christmas, my true love sent to me oh nine scimitars dancing, eight iron maids are milking, seven swans of Bryn Argola singing, six hunting Moza laying, five soul rings, four thrumming birds, three thran lens, two turtle dubscapes, and a warden of the first tree. On the tenth day oh of my Christmas, God. my true love sent to me, <laughs> ten cast lords a leaping, nine scimitars dancing, eight iron maids a milking, seven swans of Bryn Argola singing, Six hunting moas a laying, five soul rings, four thrumming birds, three thran lands, two turtle dubscapes, and a warden of the first tree. <laughs> On the eleventh day of Christmas, my true love sent to me eleven satyrs piping, ten cast lords a leaping, nine scimitars dancing, eight iron maids a milking, seven swans of Bryn Argola singing, six hunting moas a laying, five soul rings, four thrumming birds, three thran lands, two turtle dubscapes, and a warden of the first tree. <laughs> On the twelfth day of Christmas, oh, yeah. my true love sent to me, twelve spring leaves drumming, eleven satyrs piping, ten chaos lords a leaping, nine scimitars dancing, eight iron maids a milking, seven swans of Bryn Argola singing, six hunting moas a laying, Five soul rings, four thrumming birds, three thran lids, two turtle dubscapes, and a warden of the first tree. Yay! <laughs> wow. <laughs> you did it! <laughs> Credit to, to Gabby Sparts for actually coming up with that. Uh, so <laughs> she, she tweeted that out about a couple days ago, so we'll, we'll be linking to that too. But uh, <laughs> wow. I was inspired. I, I will not punish you with my singing voice much more, but uh, I, I felt it was appropriate for, for this particular occasion.